I'm really glad to have you here for the last fireside chat of the year. And today we have Martin Craighead. Uh, Martin is a graduate of our IEMBA program, 1998. IEMBA was a predecessor of a program that we run today called the America's MBA. Uh, in fact, uh, some of you probably noticed there were a lot of uh, other students running around the building last week. They were all America's students. We had folks here from Brazil, Mexico, Canada. It was a, a, a fun week, part of their residency uh, here. But Martin was in uh, kind of the first version of that, which we ran in Miami. Um, uh, most of the, his experience was in Miami. He came Sorry. here some of the time, but right. a lot of it was in Miami. And um, it has been kind of a long uh, strategy of ours to focus on the Latin American uh, uh, area and kind of the Americas uh, in general. And uh, IEMBA was really kind of our first uh, attack at that. But uh, prior to that, uh, Martin <coughs> is a fellow Penn State grad, uh, yeah. fellow Penn State engineering grad, yeah. though uh, he uh, did chemical engineering, no, petroleum, petroleum, petroleum. petroleum and uh, has been in that business too whole long. career, yeah, right, yeah, Always and at Baker Hughes, most of all that time, all right? my, yeah. um, uh, really starting as an engineer and then coming along to get an MBA at Owen and working his way up, uh, eventually spending the last five years as CEO of the company, but uh, uh, prior to that, playing lots of other roles, president for seven years, uh, COO. Uh, running drilling operations, just about everything. I think he must have tagged every box. Just about. Uh, just about, yeah. But that last five years, I will say, is uh, um, probably one that, uh, you know, you probably learned no, like more in five years than, than you had yeah. in your whole life. I mean, in the sense that um, Martin was leading Baker Hughes at a very interesting time in the company's history. Of course, it was uh, a really uh, tough time in the energy business in general, um, but they had entered into an agreement to uh, merge with a uh, large competitor that went through two years of antitrust challenges and eventually uh, failed uh, the antitrust uh, hurdle. And uh, Martin was on the, the tip of the spear that whole time. And uh, I remember visiting you many times down in Houston that time, and it was an up, down, up, down, up, down. It'll get through. No, it won't. It'll get through. It'll, yeah. Just uh, really an amazing, amazing uh, learning experience, I'm sure. But, uh, but the story ends well in the sense that uh, um, even though uh, the deal didn't happen, uh, Baker Hughes walked away with a very big payment from that competitor, uh, like in the B's yeah. uh, payment uh, from that competitor, and uh, subsequently uh, was acquired by General Electric. And um, uh, in a story that really was a, a great, great exit for the, for the company at that time, uh, after just a really, really kind of crazy set of years navigating both the challenges in energy and then uh, this merger. Right. So I, I, I have to believe you, you really, I mean, I, I kid around, but I can't imagine how much learning happened in that period of time. Uh, just a tremendous amount of learning. And so we're really excited to have him here today uh, to tell you a little bit about his uh, story. And of course, uh, he's here to answer your questions. So be thinking about things that you'd love uh, to hear about, because uh, he's had a really interesting career, an interesting set of experiences. But to tee it off, we've got a little piece <coughs> that we're going to play uh, out of video first, and then uh, we'll turn it to Martin. This is going to be a combined stock and cash transaction valued at 34.6 billion dollars some of the key things here are the willingness to divest seven and a half billion dollars worth of revenues i have to tell you on friday i i've said that there's so much that has to happen here i can't imagine they could pass but you know in the eyes of the antitrust regulators this is a three to two essentially for certain services offered to oil producers and three to two mergers just don't fly oil field services companies halliburton and baker hughes calling off their 28 billion dollar merger after regulators sued to stop it on competitive grounds halliburton will pay baker hughes a three and a half billion dollar breakup fee Bloomberg News reported, according to sources familiar with the situation, that uh, GE was interested in buying uh, or, or was at least exploring the possibility of buying some parts of Baker Hughes. Now it is official. General Electric and Baker Hughes are merging their operations. If you're able to play in a, in a 
much broader array of the oil and gas sector, and you couple upstream uh, uh, our domain with, with GE's more midstream, downstream domain, then you can go to the customer community, Alex, and have a conversation about reducing their dollars per barrel, improving their recovery factors, op optimizing their production profiles, all of the urgent issues that are facing the customers. I look a lot younger back then. Than it was only a couple years ago. Well, listen, uh, Dean, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's an honor to be here. Thanks to all you for, you know, spending the afternoon here. My wife said to me yesterday, she came out with me. Had this talk been yesterday, no one would have showed up. I mean, the weather was absolutely perfect. So uh, I appreciate you all being here. Um, so there's a few things I wanted to, I guess, touch on and then uh, open it up for Q&A, OK? Um, so you saw this video, and you can tell um, when these deals hit the wire, um, both of them were, were leaks to the press. Um, and a, my first learning was things don't leak to the press. <laughs> uh, things are given to the press and framed into a leak. That's always a, a negotiating tactic in these type of transactions, particularly hostile ones. Um, but as you could see from that, these were big in terms of valuation, right? These were 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 massive. I think the, uh, the Halliburton deal would have been um, one of the biggest in that particular year. Um, but they were also known for some other reasons. They were, would have been transformative to the oil and gas industry and dramatically to the services business. As the one uh, analyst there mentioned, this was a three to two, that particular deal, merger, um, which would have created a, a high concentration of market power. And we'll get a little bit, I'll get to that a little bit later, which is what kind of uh, translated to the, to the big breakup fee. Um, but they were also kind of known, particularly the first one again, um, because it was a very contentious negotiation. Um, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a street fight. It was a knife fight. Uh, and as, as Dean Johnson mentioned, it lasted uh, uh, for well over 18 months, the actual uh, Department of Justice review, but certainly the toughest part was in the negotiating uh, with a hostile, you know, pursuer. So what I want to talk about a little bit is I'll give you a little bit uh, the background on the industry, structure of the industry, some of the trends, and some of you have have grown up in the oil and gas industry, so so uh, you'll you'll know that very well. Um, and then I want to touch on, as as Dean Johnson mentioned, uh, you know, some of the learnings that I can share with you. And uh, I'll tell you this, though. If anybody would have told me what I'm going to tell you, I pr probably wouldn't have learned a heck of a lot from it. You have to live it. You know, it's like anything, right? You know, that old proverb, experience is the best teacher. Uh, in this case, I had just the most brutal teacher you can possibly think of, right? <laughs> but it, it is the best way to, you know, to, to gain experience and, um, and learn. But I'll do the best I can to kind of impart to you the those nuggets of wisdom that I was able to get. So a little bit about the industry. You know, oil was, was founded up in Titusville, Pennsylvania. Uh, didn't do a whole lot until it was a massive discovery in Spindletop uh, outside of Houston. Today, oil accounts for 50%. And, and I want to point this out because, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know an oil company executive that, that doesn't embrace all forms of energy, whether it be nuclear, coal, or renewables. But the fact of the matter is that oil and gas accounts for 50% of the world's energy needs and well over 90% of the world's transportation needs. So while there's a lot of press and a lot of rhetoric around some of these alternatives, which is important, uh, life as we know it today would not exist without oil and gas. It is the foundation of most modern, modern economies. It employs over 10 million people, 10 million people in the U.S. alone. Um, and good or bad, outside of religion, I don't know another industry that has the most geopolitical influence uh, as, as oil and gas. Like it or not, it's, uh, you know, that's its, that's its role. Um, okay, so, you know, that's the industry. Um, now, there's been quite a bit of 
you know, the oil and gas industry, when I joined it back in 82 out of Penn State, um, was, for the lack of a better word, you know, kind of benign. Um, it wasn't sexy. People didn't brag that their kids went into the oil and gas business. Um, but about 15 years ago, something remarkable happened. Um, prior to that point, if you were a geologist, you would work for an oil company, pretty traditional, you know, big oil company. And your, your pursuit of oil and gas would be honed around a few capabilities. First, you would look for what's called a source rock. This is where the oil and gas actually formed. And these things could be hundreds of miles and square, you know, square miles. But finding that wasn't adequate. You had to find a place where the oil and gas would migrate to. And it would, it would always migrate to a point where it was trapped. And so the lingo was you had to search for traps. And then you would drill that trap. And you either got three things. People would say there's a dry hole. There's no such thing as a dry hole. It's either water, which is considered dry, because it's uneconomic, or it's oil and gas. So a really good geologist would pursue these traps, make a name for themselves, and that's how oil companies formed, right? Shell was formed in Brunei back, you know, a century ago. ExxonMobil is a combination of companies, but all of these were really just, you know, geologists who were able to compile together assets and build a lot of economic wealth. However, probably back in 2000 and early 2000s, there was a, lingo, a term going around called peak oil. This is when people actually be believed that the world was going to run out of oil and gas because these traps hadn't all been discovered, but certainly economically sensible ones had been discovered. And we were moving further offshore, deeper waters, Macondo, the deep water horizon. These are hellacial type of environments to drill in. Arctic. And so people were thinking, we're going to run out of oil and gas. Uh, but what happened? You know, good old, and this is the truth, good old U.S. ingenuity, entrepreneurism, and technology. I tell people, Houston is exactly like Silicon Valley. It's only, but it's all about oil and gas. It is hyper-competitive. It's young. It's aggressive. Aggressive capital flows, and people invent. So what happened? We went back to these source rocks where everybody knows where they are. It doesn't really take a genius geologist to find these. And we were able to drill them, not vertically, but horizontally. And the inventors of that, Baker Hughes being one of them, Schlumberger being another one, Halliburton, it's the oil and gas service sector. And then how many of you have heard this term, and hopefully none of you have been walking around with a sign saying this, Fracking. Have you, you all heard about fracking? Well, there's a lot of politics around it, but really, it's been around a long time, but applied to these horizontal wells, a typical reservoir in the past would be, at best, maybe more, but generally the thickness of this room. So if you drilled through it vertically, you had a, a six-inch diameter well bore tube put through a rock this thick. That's about the extent of the reservoir exposure you had to that well. If you drill into this, and now today drill three miles horizontally in this 50-foot space, you can imagine the amount of reservoir that's opened up. Does that make sense? And then you frack it hundreds and hundreds of times, and you create all kinds of cracks. And so these reservoirs are now are produced. And what you have today in the oil and gas industry is what's called the Shell Revolution. And it's made the United States the number one oil producer in the world. And when I joined this business, it was a country in the Middle East that was the number one oil producer in the world, and no longer. In fact, today, the U.S. is an oil exporter. And while we import more than we export, who would have ever thought that was the case? And we're exporting gas now more than ever and probably going to increase that. Okay? So that's kind of how the industry's evolved. And uh, one other point before I move into these deals. The structure of this industry. And again, some of you understand this. Some of you will probably won't understand this at all. Oil and gas companies are really very similar to a real estate developer. They have, a lot, they have some people, and they go out and then they secure land. Actually, they secure the subsurface below the land, and they lease it. And then they bring in what's called the oil field service companies, again, Baker Hughes, FMC, G Oil and Gas, whoever it is, to explore for 
the hydrocarbon, to drill the wells, and then to produce it. Okay? Now, so that's the sector I grew up in, the service industry. You have a downstream sector, which are your refiners, the Valeros and the Marathons. You have a midstream sector, which are the pipeline companies, Kinder Morgan and Williams and companies. And then you have the upstream sector, which are your, generally your big oil and gas producers like Exxon, Shell, BP, Total out of France. And in that section of upstream oriented companies, you have the big, some of the biggest companies in the world. And one is in the press a lot now, particularly its latest debt offering, which was so oversubscribed, is Saudi Aramco, right? Considered to be the most valuable company in the world. During its IPO discussions a couple years ago, people said this valuation could exceed a trillion dollars. Right? So those companies make up what's called national oil companies. So while Shell, Exxon are big, really big, are the oil companies that are owned by the governments. Saudi Aramco by Saudi Arabia, Petronas by Malaysia, Ecopetrol by Colombia, Petrobras by Brazil. You get the idea? Okay, so upstream, midstream, downstream, and then the service sector, okay? Three big players in the service side. Schlumberger, next Halliburton, third Baker Hughes. Baker Hughes and Halliburton together wouldn't equal the size of Schlumberger. One of those first rules in business, first mover advantage. If you do it like 100 years before somebody else, you get a heck of a chance to grow. Schlumberger is a, primarily a French-based company, kind of invented a lot of the technology and was in it a long time before anybody else. Baker Hughes, the Hughes comes from Howard Hughes. Not the reclusive one who's the movie mogul and pilot and nobody knows if he's dead or alive kind of thing. It's his father. His fortune was made inventing the rotary drill bit that's used in the oil and gas industry, still used today. And Baker comes from a gentleman by the name of R.C. Baker who invented something it's called a casing shoe, which is still used today which is when the wells are actually put on production. So Baker Hughes, Halliburton, and Schlumberger. So what happened back in 2014? In October of 2014, I was in my office meeting with our bankers. Our bankers have always been Goldman Sachs. And we were going through a bit of a rough patch. Oil was coming down a little bit. It was probably $100 a barrel in July. It had trickled down to about 80. Not a big deal, we, it's a very cyclical industry. But nevertheless, margins were under pressure, revenues were, were softer than they should be. And we were in discussions of what are we gonna do here with our portfolio? Prior to me becoming CEO, we had made a big acquisition that had become very, very problematic, actually a fracking business. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about M&A in a second, but it was problematic because it was a business we didn't fully understand. Some investment bankers had walked in, done the old proverbial white space, and said, look, Halliburton lines up here, Schlumberger lines up here, you have this gap. Well, my predecessor, predecessor bought it, and, uh, and I was running it as COO, but it was a son of a gun. And it was hurting our business. And so we were in, talking to our bankers saying, what could we do here with this thing? Um, I didn't want to suggest we sell it because the, my board had been the board who approved buying it just a few years earlier, and I knew that, wouldn't, that would not be a very good discussion. So we had to do something different. That same doggone day, I get an inbound call from the CEO of Halliburton, which is highly unusual. We're cross-town rivals. Um, there's no love lost between the two of us, uh, either individually or as companies. Very different cultures. Um, on the other hand, it wasn't totally unheard of. There's always opportunities for cooperation around, uh, you know, joint ventures. Maybe he had something he wanted to sell that he thought I wanted to buy or vice versa. Unbeknownst to me, three days later when we met, he had a, a proposal to buy the entire company. And the offer he put on the table when I opened it up was attractive. I knew at that moment we had our hands full. This was an offer that had our shareholders been, had it been made available to our shareholders, given where the industry was kind of trending, in this premium, it would be hard to say no to. So there was certainly a part of me that wanted to rip it up and throw it back at him, 
But there was obviously the part I get paid for that said, I have to consider this. But I have to consider it under the right conditions. So I went back to the office, convened my board on, the, on a phone call, and it was time to go to guns. I mean, drop the gloves and really get into some, I wouldn't say defensive moves, defensive moves only to the extent that it would improve the deal we could get for our shareholders. So Goldman Sachs obviously stepped up, and then we compiled a cadre of M&A advisory firms, legal firms. And it became very clear to me that, um, that this was going to be a lot of unexplored territory. As you saw in the video, uh, sh the lady mentioned two things. One was $7.5 billion of assets that had to be sold or offered to be sold, and the other was the breakup fee. It kind of flew in the face of conventional wisdom that a number two, and at that time we had, uh, well, we were number three. We had 60-some thousand employees, operated in 80 countries, and had about $25 billion in revenue. Halliburton was, say, I don't know, say 20 to 30 percent bigger in all terms of that, employees, countries, and numbers. Two and three coming together, while it wouldn't equal the number one player, would be a massive amount of market concentration. So we had a DOJ issue, uh, antitrust issue. And then the other issue was this uh, $7.5 billion. How did that come up? Well, in this, in this M&A jargon, there's something, for the lack of a better term, this is what lawyers call it, hell or high water clause. And what that means is if a buyer comes in and says, I want to buy you, but we're going to have some issues with antitrust, the seller says, which was us, okay, but you got to do everything in your power to make this deal work. Because if you put me into play, we go into chaos as an organization. And can you imagine if Harvard walked in here and said, we're buying Vanderbilt? You don't know where your degree is going to come from, right? I mean, a, a lot of, you don't know what your professor, you don't know who the dean's going to be the next blah, 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 right? It creates chaos in your organization. So there has to be a, uh, a benefit to getting into a deal that has such an unlikely opportunity to actually get approved. And you may say, well, why did you do it? Well, as we went through the negotiations, the premium got up to 50%. Now, I would go home at night and f try to figure out any way that I could convince a shareholder to not take this deal. But had it, before it became public, before it was you know, leaked to the Wall Street Journal, I knew that if my shareholders heard about this, they demand this deal get done. Does that make sense? A 50% return? when the industry's starting to soften. So we said, okay, Halliburton, here's the premium. We're good with that. This hell or high water, you have to agree to sell $7.5 billion of assets. They agreed to that. And then the clincher was breakup fee. Most breakup fees are 5% of value, 4 to 5% of value. We got 10% of value. In fact, it's the largest breakup fee in corporate history. If you read some of the material I sent to you, it says it's a second, only behind AT&T and T-Mobile. But that, and that was four billion, but there was a billion dollars of consideration in there for bandwidth between those two telecom companies. In terms of cash, it's the largest deal ever, ever, ever breakup fee ever, uh, not only negotiated, actually paid. But when did this deal, since we agreed to all of these things, when did this deal go hostile? Well. After it leaked to the public, uh, you know, following our mandate, we wanted more, particularly in the premium. And Halliburton said, look, this is as good as it's going to get. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace your board. And how does a company do that to a company that's 100 years old, replace their board? You simply go directly to the shareholder. So you create what's called a slate of directors, if you're Halliburton. 10 or 12 very recognizable uh, former executives, public officials, high degrees of, you know, good-looking resumes. You put that in the proxy. And then you say, okay, shareholder, Fidelity Investments, whoever it is, this group of, this board, this proposed new board of directors 
will vote for this deal. The Baker Hughes board may not. So we didn't want to get into that. But when you ever hear the term hostile, it generally re means uh, that the pursuing company, the buying company, is threatening to replace the board with a board that will do their bidding. Does that make sense? So 50% premium, industry's tanking, $3.5 billion breakup fee, and a hell, high hell or high water clause, done deal. We announced the deal. Immediately, CNBC, all these guys say, this deal can't get done. In fact, that, that crazy announcer on CNBC, the ball guy, is the, I can't think of his name, Kramer. He, you know, he was saying, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. And we're like, yeah, we agree. But we can't say no, right? So, and as, as Dean Johnson mentioned, it was one of the longest running DOJ approval sagas in the history of the DOJ. I mean, this thing, this deal set records in terms of hubris, paying 50% in these crazy numbers, to um, being one of the most, let's say, distasteful things ever put in front of the Department of Justice. It was, there was, it was, it was really difficult to try to convince them. And I had to put on that hat. I had to, you know, give testimony and depositions of why this deal made sense, which is not easy when you hate the deal. And you hate it not for your shareholders, but for the people that you grew up with and that you lead, right? Because there's no doubt that Baker Hughes would have vanished um, had this deal gone through. Fast forward 18 months, a lot of drama. Um, and then the, the government sues to block the deal, right? So here's another just quick learning. The government in the US, this is not the way it is in the European Union. We never got approval there either. There the government, the European Union can simply say, you can't do the deal. In good old American kind of small government mentality, here the government can't do that. It can't block. What it does is it says, I'm gonna sue you and take you to court to get a judge to rule and block the deal. Does that make sense? Now, if any of you have ever, and I have for other reasons, been sued by the government, you never win. They have unlimited budgets, and more importantly, they have unlimited resources and an unlimited amount of time. So generally, when a government says we're going to sue to block, companies walk away. So we walked away, or more importantly, Halliburton walked away, and 48 hours later, wired us $3.5 billion. And that money hit at a great time because <laughs> The industry had, a month after we announced the deal, took one of the mass, biggest shocks in its history. When Saudi Aramco issued a press, press release the day before Thanksgiving in 14 and said, we are no longer going to be the price setter and price controller in the market. And the market went nuts. They went after market share. They were completely, you know, fed up with Venezuela or Indonesia or Oman taking their market share. And so they said, enough of this. We'll let prices go where they can. We can produce cheaper than anybody else. Low cost producer always wins, particularly in a commodity market. And the market was destroyed, 2014. And it frankly never really fully recovered. So oil was about $100 a barrel in the summer of 14. It went down to probably in the 20s while we were in the middle of this negotiation with the DOJ, right? Drove a lot of problems for Baker Hughes because we were kind of in the standstill, right? If I go in and say, I'm gonna buy your house for 100 grand, but it's gonna take me 18 months to take it, and I don't want you to touch a damn thing because it's mine, we've agreed on it. So you can't paint the walls, you can't move the furniture, you can't redecorate, which means that as oil was tanking to 20 or $30 a barrel, we were kind of in a really bad position. When the deal broke, we came out, uh, and as some of you guys know, um, this industry is, you know, has a lot of layoffs and things like that. We laid off 30,000 people in Baker Hughes in a, in a very short span of time. During that 2015 and 16 when we couldn't do that, Halliburton, Schlumberger, and all the oil companies did the same. Uh, uh, you know, just a very tough environment. The day we announced the end of the Halliburton deal, 
I get an inbound call from GE. And you may say, well, why GE? The $7.5 billion of assets were going to be sold during all those negotiations with the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice had made it very clear. Nobody can, I'm paraphrasing, but my interpretation at the end was, nobody can buy these assets except one company because there has to be another viable competitor out there. So private equity companies were circling to buy these fantastic assets, whether they be Halliburton assets or Baker Hughes assets. The hell or high water clause said seven and a half billion, okay? Some of them were from Halliburton, some were from Schlumberger. Private equity wanted that badly. But the government's more concerned about preserving competition. So the only company that had the capability and with the means was General Electric. So for the court, for that previous 12 months, GE was examining every asset of Baker Hughes. So while, while I was surprised the day after the merger that GE called, I guess I shouldn't have been very surprised. They had looked under our tent for a year and liked what they saw and came in. And, and it didn't start with a full, here's a premium, blah, blah, blah. It started with, let's just say, much more cordial approach. We looked, we talked about joint ventures and eventually what became clear was these two companies should be together. And unlike the previous deal, where you could line them up and you had market concentration, market power, G oil and gas was more of a midstream, downstream. Remember I said the structure, upstream, midstream, downstream? Baker Hughes plays more upstream. G oil and gas played more midstream and downstream. Had some upstream, but mostly. And so what you had is while you were able to build scale, which in a capital intensive industry is always scale is your friend, if you can also achieve scope, you win. So, and the other, the other interesting, I think, tidbit was, or learning for me was, and, and a lot of you, you know, I'm sure, and some of your friends, and, and certainly Vanderbilt feeds a lot of the investment banking Wall Street world. But if you run an industrial company or any company, you have to be very uh, uh, dedicated to your own organization's growth and be respectful of your investor needs, but don't be, don't be subordinated to it. Don't succumb to it. Because certainly the street, besides the 50% premium from Halliburton, loved the fact, which is why I think my predecessor bought that fracking business. It lined us up to look very similar to the other two, just smaller. Does that make sense? We were in the same businesses. And the reason Wall Street loves that is they can compare A, B, and C. You all look the same. So I just look at earnings potential, blah, blah, blah. I look at EBITDA numbers. I look at margins. I look, and, I, it, and you're all the same. The last thing you want to be is the same. It's much more valuable to be unique. Okay? Because if you're the same, then the only thing you can try to achieve is to be the best. And the Pursuit of being the best is an extremely expensive pursuit. Why? Because every customer has a defi different definition of what the best is. If I ask all of you here, what's the best restaurant? You're not going to agree. If I ask you what's the most important thing at a restaurant or an airline, you're not going to agree. And yet, if you pursue the best strategy, it's a very expensive strategy. However, if you have a unique offering that nobody else has, which Baker Hughes GE now does relative to Schlumberger and Halliburton, while it's a little bit more difficult for the street to understand, once they understand it, you're in a much more uh, advantageous position. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the history of the deals. As Dean Johnson mentioned, from start to finish, it was about two and a half years. In that two and a half years, the amount of learning and the intensity was off the charts. I really don't know of any other CEO that went through the same amount of, if you will, um, dynamics, right? It's just, it was, it was indescribable. On the other hand, it was a privilege, right? Whatever you sign up, you know, if, whatever you sign up for, if you have the opportunity to be in what some would consider to be hellacious conditions, but if that's your, your chosen pursuit and you have the privilege of doing it, then you, you, you know, you're fortunate. So what were some of the learnings? Um, I guess the first one I want to mention to you is um, as you embark on your careers, 
you know, you're going to be subject matter experts based greatly on the education you had prior to here and then here. But eventually, as, you know, as your, as your equity grows, as your personal brand grows, it, 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 can only, it can only really, I guess, get there if your leadership capabilities grow with it. And any opportunity you have to put yourself in, let's just call it harm's way, the most difficult of circumstances, don't run from it, run towards it. You'll be, the, I can assure you, you will be the only one running towards it. People just avoid the very difficult circumstances. If your organization finds itself with a compliance bust, you know, a bribery accusation, or some kind of ethical breach, run towards solving the problem. Um, if you're, you know, if you're, if you have an opportunity to manage a product line, or, or be a consultant, or be an analyst in a, in a sector that's being brutalized, where the economics are harsh, go there. You will, you have a very short amount of time for your professional life. It probably seems like forever. It's not. Run towards the most difficult environments. You will grow a lot faster. You will also set yourself apart. And, you know, that's the best advice I could give you, okay? Um, the second thing. And some of you are going to, you know, I'm sure move into the consulting world, again, the investment banking world. M&A, mergers and acquisitions, divestitures, it's a, it's, it's, it's a necessity of, in, of, of business. Make no doubt, mistake about it. And it's also the sexiest in many ways. It's interesting. It's fascinating. And you'll find yourself, whether you're on, let's say, the operator side, like myself, running a company, looking to sell something, looking to buy a company, or if you're in the advising side, like the investment banking, you will be consumed with the numerics, the valuations, the EBITDA multiples, the premiums. Those are all very important. But let me tell you something. They're made up. They're a combination of a lot of really smart, people, smart people's assumptions. What's the next five-year EBITDA projection? What's revenue growth in this sector? What kind of synergies can we get out of putting these two companies together in terms of costs, removals? They're assumptions. While they're very important, and it's all that the street really cares about, if you want to set yourself apart, again, either as the operator or on the advising side, be respectful for another element, which is the fit. It's not just a white space story. Do these businesses, do they truly complement? Can the management team that's buying this business run this business? If they can't, is the talent available? When they ascertained that they wanted this business, since they're not in the business, has anybody asked them, do they even understand the business? Do you understand what I'm asking, what I'm saying? It's not just about numbers. You can't just look at a spreadsheet and say, oh, they're going to pay 11 times EBITDA. Last year, this business would have went for 13 EBITDA. That's a good deal. It makes, no, it isn't. It might be, but, but a lot more questions have to be asked, okay? And it's around culture, fit, mindset of the organizations, okay? Um, Another one, and I've, I've, I've mentioned this to Dean Johnson on a multiple times. In those periods of, let's say, chaos and stress, where leadership is really tested, you see what people are made of. And it doesn't matter where you're at on the food chain. I had guys on the factory floor that had more courage than people on my leadership team, right, in terms of weathering this hostile move. Food chain has no relationship towards leadership. You may get paid a lot more because people think you're a strong leader. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are. In times of chaos, and you're the leader, 
You make sure you surround yourself with the absolute best people you can. Now, I'm sure that's in your HR book somewhere. So it's nothing profound. You know what the hard part's gonna be? You need to plow the road to create opportunities to bring in the best leadership. Because there's no way in hell your company has it all already. But it does exist. And then when the circumstances change, as it did for us in October of 14, when it was all hands on deck, man your battle stations, we're going to war, I had to plow the road, remove people, and made sure I brought in the very best people for the task at hand. It's a tough job, but had, we would not have ended up where we did if we didn't have that kind of talent during that crisis. Do you understand? Now, when you have the best talent, and I don't care if you're running, you know, a, a, geogra a geography, when I ran Venezuela or Latin America or Asia, or if you're running a product line at Coca-Cola, or if you're a, a, managing a, an element of a consulting advisory business, you surround yourself with the best people, but at the end of the day, you be as inclusive as you can but it's up to you to call the ball. You have to be, at, at, above everything else, decisive. Okay? I used to tell people, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I'm sure as hell not in doubt. So what the heck does that mean? It means when you make a decision, and by the time a CEO has to make the decision, it's pretty much because nobody else knows what the hell to do. You don't know if you're right or wrong. What you can never be is unsure. And I think that applies and I, I, to no matter where you are in an organization. is call the ball and be decisive and never be in doubt. Okay? Um, And then I guess the last point is back to this leadership element. I saw folks operate brilliantly. I mean, like geniuses in terms of strategy or insights. Um, and certainly, in times of difficulty, intelligence, you know, being able to see around the corner before somebody else, being able to read the tea leaves, instinct, highly valuable. And, and prized. But just like my analogy back to, it's not only about the numbers, it's about the culture. Under leadership, it's not just about how smart you are. And while those things are valuable, intelligence is valuable, I'd say heart is a virtue. It'll set you apart as a leader. You know, there's no such thing as leadership if nobody follows. And people aren't going to follow a robot or a machine or a brilliant analysis. People don't follow that. At least not generally the people you want to have working in your company, right? So remember to always, you know, work on being a heartful leader as well as a brilliant strategist, you know, decisive leader. You have to kind of have the whole package. It's not easy, uh, but particularly in times of difficulty, chaos, when your organization is struggling or being attacked, whatever it is. And it can even just be a, you know, a weak quarter. You know, people want to want to make sure that the person they're working for is the whole package. So that's. 24 months of learning right there. <laughs> that's, that's kind of all I have. So now it's Q&A. When you get the Owen degree, your bargaining power has gone way up. It was only a few months after I graduated from here that uh, we were living in Caracas at the time. And my second daughter was just born. Uh, I think right around the time I graduated from here and uh, with the IAMBA degree, and uh, uh, was it Hugo Chavez, is that his name? Yeah. 
led a revolution in Venezuela. So I said, you know, Baker Hughes, uh, you sent me here on an 18-month assignment. It's been seven years. <laughs> so, you know, trust isn't real high here. And you're telling me you're going to move me out of this war zone, because it had turned into a war zone. I got two young daughters. May, I, I shouldn't have to remind you that you paid for my Vanderbilt degree, and thank you very much. But you got about two weeks to move me, or I'm moving without you. So that was my first. And they said, how's Singapore? I said, fabulous. Right? <laughs> so then I knew my negotiating skills were getting better. But the Owen degree certainly helps you, OK? Um, and I tell my daughter this. You know, She joined Baker Hughes uh, shortly after I retired. She's a petroleum engineer. And you know, I tell everybody I can that raise your hand when others don't. Look for opportunities that, or at the very least, how many times we, we've gone to what we used to call high potentials, high pots, right? And, um, and we'd say, we want to move you to you know, Moscow or London or you know, Port Harcourt, Nigeria or, or Saudi Arabia. It's a global industry. And how many you know, would say no? I get it if they have a special needs parent or child. I don't get it when they're afraid or they're not willing to sacrifice a spouse's career. You know, I don't get that. You can't have it all. You can't be CEO and have a balanced life. You can't be COO. You can't be CFO. You can't be a lot of jobs and have a balanced life. So, and it gets back a little bit to, well, you, you know, you can move to London, or you can move to Abuja, Nigeria. Where do you think you're going to get the most, if you're in the oil and gas business, where do you think you're going to get the most uh, skill set built the fastest? It isn't in London, right? So, you know, you bargain hard. You make sure it's worth your while. But at the same time, you, in pursuit of your career, which has got to be built on skills that you're able to demonstrate over time, you have in, in higher density, in higher quantity than anybody else. So the board will select you to be the next CEO. You're only going to do that, again, time moves fast. And in your world, it's moving even faster. When I joined this industry, no CEO was in their 40s. The guy that replaced me that I gladly handed it over to, one of the sweetest men I know, He's 45, and he's running a $40 billion company. So you guys, it's really, you don't have nine innings, you know? You, all of a sudden, you've got like six. So move fast, look for hot spots, no matter what, you know, however you define a hot spot in your world, right? That you, you know, industry you go in. Does that, make, does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So I grew up in the line, right, where you have a P&L. And it started with a little teeny one, and it you know, got to where it got. The nice thing about being a line manager is people do what you say, right? You, have, you start with three people working for you all the way to 60,000. But you're, you're, you're not, if, the, the, I think the, the most successful leaders are the ones that don't have to play that do what I say card or you're fired. They're the greatest, the greatest leadership I think trait is being a, is influence management, is galvanizing an organization, galvanizing people because they want to follow you, not because they have to follow you. And in your world, more than mine, you have it a lot more difficult. People today are of such a valuable commodity. If they don't want to follow you, they're going to go somewhere else. You know, certainly my parents, and even in my early stages, we worked because, well, we didn't have a lot of, we worked where we worked because we didn't have a lot of opportunity. And I didn't want to be poor. So I just kept working as hard as I could. Didn't have a lot of optionality. Today, as your brand's, personal brand strengthen, you have optionality, which means the people working for you do. 
So the, the best jobs I ever had were the ones I hated the most, which is when they weren't in the line. They were staff positions where I, I couldn't tell anybody to do anything. That sucks. But that's where it hones your influence skills the best because you got to get people to do things which, you know, they're, they're doing other things, they're busy. But when I had a marketing job running a division of Baker Hughes, uh, it was a job that, like, never was successful. It was a position that nobody was successful in. And I had a mentor. That's another key thing is find people that you trust, that, that look, look after you. And you'll know right away if, they're, if their motivations are pure. And, and I've been fortunate to have two or three mentors that, that could never have got where I got without them. But this one put me in this job that nobody was successful in. And he said, I won't let you fail, but you need this. And he was right. OK? And probably for people who do well in, in, in staff jobs, like HR, marketing, technology, finance, you know, uh, I put CFOs running countries with line responsibility because the pressure to see what they're made of. Can they, can they call the ball and be decisive when they have to? Can they, can they invest? Can they generate a return on investment, not just analyze? Can they hire talent? Can they retain talent? Uh, it's a good way to weed people out. And some of them now are better, better CFOs, no doubt, because they spent time not just being up the finance organization, treasury, and blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense? So. Yeah. Find out what you're good at and then spend some time wh where you're not. It's a good question. You know, I'm not so sure that if you're the seller and you're looking to monetize and get the highest value, that you have a, a responsibility to worry about that. Um, you do from a perspective of, let's say, you know, you know, the, 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 the human assets that are going with that, with the physical assets, you, you might want to ask a lot of probing questions of the buyer, you know, what kind of, to try to understand the culture, try to understand their, the, the career development elements, try to understand uh, what kind of people make up that organization. And putting aside private equity, let's just say the public markets, which keeps everything kind of honest. If you're the seller, you know, I, I think you, you want to run those traps, but you don't stop a deal. Because you, again, your mandate is set forth by your board and your, and, and, and your investors, and you're going to get the highest value. That's a, I'm glad you asked that question because that's a, it's a great clarifying point. I think it really, that falls on the, on the buyer. Their fiduciary responsibility is to get value for what they're spending their shareholders' money on, right? Yeah. And like I said, too often it's, they don't look at that. You know, there's, there's a multi, multi, multitude of, uh, ways to answer that. I think at the end of the day, uh, what I leveraged was the fact that I worked at the company for 30 years, at the, you know, more or less at that time. Um, I didn't know all 60,000, obviously, but I can assure you all 60,000 knew me one way or the other. They knew where I come from. In terms, I was one of them. Um, and that uh, in constant engagement and communication, um, not cutting back on investment, even when things are going down, um, balancing. We had to be very careful. You know, we, we, we had a high suspicion this deal wasn't going to get through. However, through that 18, 19 months, had we ever done or said, let alone worked towards blocking the deal, Halliburton could have sued us for breach of contract, we sure as hell would never have seen three and a half billion dollars. So we could never, you know, one of the things that were not open to us, I couldn't walk into a room of engineers in uh, Kuala Lumpur and say, 
let's hope this deal doesn't happen because that would have been a breach. So to keep people fired up and working, you just really play to their heart, right? No matter what, whether we're part of Halliburton or we're independent, of course, we didn't know anything about GE at the time. Should have, because they were looking at our businesses, but you just play to the fact that we're gonna keep doing what we do, and we're really good at it. Our customers depend on us, and we have a role to play. Um, I lost one, actually went to GE Oil & Gas, one senior executive off my team, uh, and that was it through the whole 18, 19 months. No one abandoned us. Now, I shouldn't say no one. We, we lost a lot. But in terms of, let's say, what I used to, every board meeting, critical loss, right? Uh, I had one, which I think was pretty good. Um, but I, I think it just gets down to, can people trust you to do the right thing for them? And in Midland, Texas, I went there, and I got to tell you, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, Midland. I remember landing in the middle of the night in Midland, just days after this deal got announced. I hadn't slept for, I swear, <laughs> felt like months or weeks. The room is packed. Guys in their coveralls, uh, engineers, technicians, administration staff. And I couldn't hold it together. I mean, all of the stress had started to manifest itself. And I could see the sorrow in the people's eyes. And, and more, not necessarily, no, sorrow is the wrong word, fear. The industry is imploding. And now your most high, hated rival has made a hostile public deal to acquire you. That is not, the, that's not going to end well. For you as an individual. So the fear was, and I remember, I mean, I, I choked up. I, I lost it. I think that vulnerability to a degree and that, on, you know, drives honesty. So we came out really well through that deal. And then, as Dean Johnson mentioned, the, the Cinderella moment was when G Oil and Gas and GE wanted to kind of exit the business, put their business with Baker Hughes, paid our shareholders a really nice dividend, paid us a heck of a premium, and we loved the management team. Well, yeah, we felt, people ask about this GE thing. We fell in love with the girl we married. It's her in-laws that are a little bit weird. Huh? <laughs> the, the, the GE thing, obviously, you know, even to, and to their to their defense, you know the people, you know, the the top leadership of GE, which is no longer there, didn't know some of the problems that they that they had, um, and nobody did. But in terms of these two businesses together, and it's fantastic. And our people in Midland, Texas, are, you know, they're good. So, but we didn't know it at the time it was going to be good. You know, people just have to trust and they're, you know, did I answer your question? I get really, uh, angry is the wrong word, but just annoyed with this whole balanced thing. I, I just don't think that has a place if you have ambitions. If you don't have ambitions, and I envy it. But uh, um, I think, you know, um, that's a great question. I will tell you this, there's nothing I would do differently. You know, the mist, I mean, I made a lot of soccer games, I made a lot of dance recitals, blah, blah, blah. I did, I really did. And I, I think a lot of people would say, I did an amazing amount considering, but do I, would, I, would I give up what I was able to achieve to do more of that? No. Um, so I wouldn't do anything differently. But certainly the biggest sacrifice is your time with the people you love. But on the other hand, because of, you know, I think work ethic and ambition, you know, 
my kids grew up in international schools, lived in Asia, lived in Latin America. Uh, they're pretty well-rounded. They're not, I can show you, not perfect. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I wouldn't do anything differently. Good question. Out of time? Out of time. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you staying.